it should be live. Usually we are live now, but my screen doesn't quite say we're live. So I talk like this and we're going to talk about education. Um, so as soon as we're live, I'll be introducing Kate Knight and Bill Clark. So Kate is a um, Bratton Hove City Councillor, Deputy Chair in the Education Committee and a local ward councillor for um, my constituency in Walsingham and Bevendine, where we've been having a big fight to try and save the local primary school uh, there. Uh, Phil Clark, who I've also got that you can see on the screen, is um, uh, not only a local um, uh, activist, but he is more importantly a National Education Union uh, officer um, in East Sussex, a teacher, of course, um, and he has been liaising a lot about um, what the advice should be for schools on East Sussex and leading a lot of the union's response around whether schools should open up or not, or whether it's safe to. I think everyone, everyone wants to open up, don't they? I mean, that's my feeling, but no one wants to do it unsafely. And there's a fear that um, some of this is being rushed. So look, I'm gonna um, just open my pitch and then I'll go to uh, Kate and Phil uh, in a second. Uh, the Labour Party's view is quite clear. We should open up, but there should be a clear negotiated plan of how to do that with the unions based on the best advice that we can do. And the, the National Education Union, I'm sure Phil will maybe mention, and I had a briefing um, in the Socialist Campaign Group last night with the General Secretary um, and a former General Secretary who's joined the Socialist Campaign Group um, because she's now in the Lords and we allow Lords to observe our meetings. Um, we had a good discussion around um, what those conditions should be, you know, kind of making sure the replication rate is below a certain level, ensuring that teachers can be protected, particularly thinking about um, vulnerable shielded families that children might come from. And all of those things, I know Rebecca Long Bailey is, is very keen to ensure that this government seems desperate to bring children back, not all children. And let's bear in mind all schools have, well, most schools, have remained open in one form or another. Most teachers have continued to work. What has yes. happened is there has been a system um, to say workers, the key workers can send their children so the class sizes are, are smaller and you can do social distancing a bit better. But even there we hear reports that it's very difficult. Um, and so the idea that you would bring back whole year groups seems a particularly difficult proposition. So we need to work out how that is best done and how it is best done with the science. Now, I know a certain date is being proposed. I said uh, earlier on this month that I thought for lots of children, there might be a case for not going back until September um, and organizing some other kinds of activities rather than schooling in classrooms, but other activities that you could mobilize some of the teaching force, you could mobilize other people to do. And we know many schools and many teachers are already doing that with online support and other kinds of things one of the suggestions uh, that, uh, that, um, uh, that, uh, that Kevin from the National Education Union said yesterday to us was, well, why don't we ask Amazon? You know, they made a huge profit. Let's, let's, let's require them to send reading books or free books to every pupil in the country. There are things that we can do in the meantime, get that to support the learning that teachers do online and then go back when we know it's safe. But the government's insisting that we go back early. And my view is, from a political point of view, it's probably for two reasons. One is because they think that the um, cost of furlough is too great and they want to make sure people are starting to get back. And they think that if children are not back at school, it's much harder to force people to go back to school. And the second reason is because actually the government, my view, has been um, a little too gung-ho with many of the... Um, uh, announcements. Rather than taking a precautionary principle, which would be my principle, they have taken a more risk um, accepting principle. I don't think that's right in a public pandemic. I think they've got the balance wrong on that and they've had it a number of times where we've heard about things like herd immunity, the slowness of the lockdown. It's not that they're bad intentions but it's that their judgment of that balance of risk versus precaution I think is wrong. And uh, um, this is a, another example of that. Look, Phil, uh, can you, um, can you uh, uh, come in here, I wonder? What, what have you been experiencing on the ground? I mean, you're particularly liaising with East Sussex. 
this is a conservative led council. We've had a few conservative led councils like Essex, where they've actually been very positive in supporting schools and said no school should go back until it's a 100% safe and they've laid out conditions and they're really backing head teachers and teachers. Where is East Sussex in that? And Brighton Hove will come to Kate in a bit as uh, similarly, but where's East Sussex been on that spectrum of things? It's, um, I think in East Sussex, what we're seeing is the playing out of uh, well over a decade now of, of breaking the school system up and the lack of um, sort of an, a local education authority acting as a local education authority. So what we've got in East Sussex is um, quite a laissez-faire position. Schools are effectively doing... We're just losing uh, you, Phil. I think that uh, we will try and come back. I think what Phil was saying is that we've got a bit of a laissez-faire um, approach where schools can do what they want, which is concerning, you know, particularly if you've got children in different schools. Kate, in, in um, we'll come back to Phil in, in, in a second. We'll but, about that. But, no, that's fine. Kate, in Brighton, mm -hmm. um, there's always talk about a family of schools yeah. uh, uh, approach. How's that working in Brighton? Well, I mean, you know, I'm, I've only been a councillor for a year, so, it, you know, it's all quite new to me. But I mean, I've been really, really impressed with our, our local schools. And when you talk about a family of schools, I mean, that's it really, it, they really do all come together and work together. I mean, you only had to look around the campaign to support Moleskoon Primary. You know, that was a, a really good example of, of how you can use the expertise across an area to support each other. Um, and I think that that's clear here. Um, I think, you know, what's been an eye opener to me is, you know, is the amount of power that schools have and the amount of discretion they have themselves, um, you know, because it's up to heads to decide whether they go back or not with obviously they need the support of their governing body. But we've tried to give a really strong steer here because we've got brilliant schools in Brighton and Hove and we spend all the time saying how great they are and what fantastic, you know, standards they achieve. And there's usually, in the Children and Young People's Committee, there's usually kind of unanimity. But I think a couple of the Conservative councils have broken rank now. I guess they feel the need to defend their government. But, um, you know, what's really important to us is that the trust that we show, that we have in the leadership of our local schools, in our family of schools, we don't abandon that trust. And if they are saying to us now, we don't feel safe, then we are not going to be privy to putting pressure on them because because some random date's been picked out of the, out of thin air. You know, it's not. It's almost insulting to think that 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 staff and heads could go back to school, but but are choosing not to. I mean, everybody wants to get back to school. We want children at school. We know they're missing out. We know that in terms of, you know, disadvantaged children, the gap widens in situations like this. Nobody wants that. But we, you know, we have said to them, for, for us and for you, we know that the, pri the priority is the health and safety and the emotional well-being as well of all the children in the school and the staff. And, uh, we, you know, we back them absolutely 100%. We trust their judgment, you know. You're mute. Thanks, Kate. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. Phil, are you back with, with us enough to I, be able to I am for the moment, what yeah. you were saying about um, the East Sussex approach, which is slightly different from the Brighton approach, is it? Yes, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure where I got to before things cut out, but... Um, you, well, you said it was a... Um, uh, yeah. But, but more, yeah, um, so East Sussex has basically said that the, first, the June the 1st is the, the date where schools can begin to return from, but haven't really provided much more of a framework than that. And that means school leaders are falling back on the government guidance, which is woeful, and trying to make a decision when the national conditions don't really allow for it. So what we're gonna see in East Sussex, although we're, we're working very hard as a union and having a good amount of success, is a lot of different approaches in a lot of different schools. And that's gonna be very difficult because you're gonna have parents who've got kids in two different schools who are taking two entirely different approaches to, to opening. Um, and of course, we've got major concerns that this is far too early because the national situation is not at a place where 
um, infections are low enough and there's a trace, a track and tracing system in place. So I think we're going to have, if we do see opening on June the 1st more widely in some schools, which we may or may not, the government might well pull back from it. Um, I think we're then going to see issues cropping up quite quickly where schools have to reclose, which is really, really something we want to avoid. Yes, that disruption of opening and closing. I mean, this is a, a bigger issue, isn't it? That there is a danger that we open lockdown up too quickly and we end up having to shut the country down. And that is far more harmful for the mm. economy, but also for education, for mm. all different sectors. You know, kind of, it, you know, I think it's great that people, for example, uh, might be able to go to the beach, but not that they can travel all the way down from London to suddenly go to our beaches and crowd it up. It's, mm. it's similar with the, the, the schools thing. If we open them up too quickly and try and go back to normal too quickly, there's a false sense of security that everything mm. is all right. And even whilst we might be opening them up cautiously, uh, it doesn't actually um, uh, it doesn't actually help. Uh, it, it, uh, Kate, have you found that most head teachers have been quite receptive in Brighton and Hove for that kind of supportive approach? I mean, I, I think they they you know they welcome our our support and they they welcome the fact that we respect their judgment. You know, it's. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they are the people that know best and to suggest that they have anything other than the best interests of their children at heart is, is completely wrong. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I want two points I wanted to make really was that, you know, people talk about the reopening of schools and you said it briefly in the, at the beginning, but, you know, almost every single school and nursery has been open throughout, you know, through the school, through the Easter holidays, bank holidays, and, you know, even those teachers that aren't in the school building are working really hard from home and I've got children who are going into school because their mums are key work grandchildren who their mums are key worker I've got children being homeschooled I've got a son-in-law that's a teacher that's desperately trying to do online lessons so you know I can see it and I used to be a teacher um so I can see it from from all sides but definitely there's a sense of you know I I would hope that the city will will kind of move together but I mean you we, there's no getting away from the fact you have to um acknowledge that every school is different as well I mean what what would be easier for some schools is going to be very very difficult I mean councillor um Les Hamilton so we have regular on the children and young people's committee we have regular uh, COVID-19 updates for the committee well we're not meeting as a committee at the moment but we have these regular updates that, that uh, John Alcock holds and um Counts, uh, councillor Atkinson uh, sorry Hamilton said he's a governor of a school and he went to a, a, a governor's meeting and they and they were just they sat there they were at a loss they said it's going to take a huge amount of organization to, to implement even the social distancing and what do you do with all the you know they've still got lots of key worker children coming in and vulnerable children obviously children that are known to social services and people like that or, or on you know educational learning plans and uh you know, they, they span the whole spectrum of all the age bands. I and mean, then all of a sudden you've got a couple of year groups coming in. I mean, what do you do with those children that aren't in those, you know, the logistics of it, the schools, it's a real, it's a real headache. It's going to take loads of careful planning. And that's what we want to say to them. Don't rush. And, you know, when you feel it's right, you've got our absolute whole support. Yes, quite right. Phil, are you with us uh, uh, again? I can see that you've uh, changed rooms. Welcome back, I've moved, Phil. I've moved to try and get closer to the connection. It's been final day and it's decided to play out it, now. But it's, all, it's, it's always how it is, isn't it? Look, before we move on to questions, I just uh, that we're getting in um, now. I wanted to ask, I saw in the report some stuff around some of the schools in Eastbourne um, and, you know, kind of coronavirus that there that's been in the papers recently. Has that been a worry for your, your, your you, there's something about Correct me if I'm wrong. That they've used one school to pool all the all all the um, key worker uh, um, support into, and now that there's been some coronavirus outbreaks in that, and and, and there's some real dangers there. Is your union been involved in some of that? Yeah, quite quite heavily. Um, there was a hub at the Cavendish School, which um, is an all through school, so primary and secondary, and then an infant and junior schools. Um, across the other side of Eastbourne were also putting their key worker and um, vulnerable children into that hub. So it was too big. And we always said it was too big. It was probably, nobody's given me a, a large one, probably the biggest gathering of people full stop in East Sussex, up to 100 people in the building over the last weeks. And that was a problem in itself. But also we've got an issue around how an outbreak is dealt with. You know, there we've had um, a member of staff 
test positive for coronavirus, but then the wider staff and the parents not told that had happened until the union found out, got involved. Um, and that's a real problem because that's happened when actually schools are operating on relatively small numbers of children. You know, it's the sort of basic thing we've got to get absolutely right before wider opening. And it's yeah. it's really gone very badly wrong in Eastbourne. Um, it's, it's caused a huge fallout. And we haven't got the testing and tracing isn't yet sorted. The the app that the government's meant to have rolled out has been delayed further. Goodness knows why they couldn't have used the standard Google uh, um, uh, Apple app, which was a joint app that they prepared themselves uh, that would help this and had privacy built in. Instead, the government's insisted in building their own app. None of these things to help um, if there was an outbreak have actually been rolled out. So there's some real concerns there. And if we've got one example already of where this has gone wrong, that could be a, well, I hope it is not, but it could be a, a dangerous um, uh, look forward. Look, I've got some questions. Now let's, let's go through them. Uh, Jez Hopkins says, whilst I understand people's concern, has anyone actually noticed how low the infection rate is in Brighton and East Sussex. We are lucky to be almost the lowest in the whole country. How exactly do people expect, so how low exactly do people expect the risk to be before the beginning to start the process of reopening schools? So Jez, I think is saying, look, you've got to choose a time sometime. Why is now not the appropriate time? Uh, I mean, my, my feeling is that I'm not making a pronouncement about well, whether now's the right time or not. I'm making a pronouncement that I don't think the government have done that thinking about what low risk they want to do, you know, kind of, and that's the problem if they haven't done that and they're the people instructing them to open. That's the concern, not the date per se. Uh, Phil, what's the, the NEU have got some tests, haven't they? To, to Yeah, uh, I mean, open. I think this is a really sensible question and it's approaching the problem from the right end. The problem we've got is the government have approached the problem completely backwards, set a date, and then we'll work out what safe looks like on that date. Mm -hmm. Whereas what this question does is say, okay, well, what should the infection rate be before we start opening? And that's, that's a really good question. And one the government still hasn't answered, a most basic question that we need answered. So there might well be, um, a good case that you do regional opening. If there are areas of the country where infection rates are lower and it would, you know, you, you could get um, a safer opening, then of course we want to open. That's, that's entirely sensible. Um, the, the issue is that's not what we've got. We've just got a, a sort of pronouncement from on high. So if infections rate, rates were low, yes, I think that's, that's, that's an excellent starting point. The second point, as Lloyd has already said, is a tracking and tracing system in place. You know, the two go hand in hand. So if you do get an outbreak, you can work out who's affected, isolate, deal with it. Without track and trace, a low infection rate is not going to work because it will simply go up. But with a high infection rate, track and trace won't work because you won't be able to keep keep hold of it. So I, it's a good question. And I think there's a good case for regionalised opening. But the government need to engage on on that question rather than just issuing a diktat and, and, and walking away, which is what they've done. And I, I would add to that because I think, you know, I do. I, again, I think you're right. I think that's coming at it from from the right place. And I suspect one of the reasons that Brighton is low and has been low throughout really lower than a lot of surrounding areas is because obviously we had we had we, we had the, the honor or not of being the very first cases in the country didn't we really mm. and um at, at a time when there was tracing going on you know before it got completely abandoned and and we were swamped so i suspect that might be one of the reasons why you know the the initial outbreak here didn't snowball in the way that it has in in other places but um you know i just I think that, that that is right to follow the science, but and I also think it's right to acknowledge that, that you can't, there's no such thing as anything that's ever 100% safe. You cannot, you can never eliminate risk entirely, but you just, you have to be certain um, in a way that, I think you said really well, Lloyd, you know, that it's pick a date and then see if it's safe rather than when it's safe. And and it may well be that, that we go to um, regional you know, openings and, and indeed, you know, regional shutdowns. I, I think I heard on the news the other day that there were some 
seven or so schools in northern France which had reopened and which closed quite quickly because there was a bit of an outbreak. So, you know, it might be that it, we, we take that approach in the future, but we don't, the thing about this is we, we don't know. The evidence is quite contradictory, isn't it, about, about how it spreads and whether children have it and whether they carry it and whether they're asymptomatic. You know, we just, it, it, it's too much of an unknown for me to take a risk with, but that's how I feel. You're right. I mean, of course, we do know whether children are asymptomatic and carry it or not. We know that children carry it on their belongings, just like a door handle has it and objects have it, you know, kind of. And so they could take it from one location yeah. to another location, back into their home or out of the mm. home, you know, kind of. And so I think there's a good question here from uh, Carmel Mary Jane. She says, will children be disciplined? And I suspect it's also the parents being disciplined because that's how the law works if they don't go back to school when they reopen. So this is, I guess, and there are many families that might be like this, that might have someone who's on the shielded list, who the government is still saying should be staying at home. Um, that might be a single parent family even. How does the child get to school if that parent has been told not to leave the, leave the house? Or just that you have a multi-generational families, all of those kind of complexities. Mm. And is there a danger that child or the parent because it's the parent that gets the fine will get punished okay is, is there any advice from Brighton on, on 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 that and then I'll go to Phil well the interestingly I was um, on Newsnight last night there was Emma Knights who's the who's the leading light in the National Governance Association which is the you know the the association for school governors um, but my understanding and, and in their guidance as well that there will be no fines for non-attendance and, and I, I think I'm sure I remember somebody saying that, that, that children wouldn't be fined, parents wouldn't be fined if children didn't go and schools won't be held to account for their attendance levels because obviously that's something that the government you know puts a lot of store by but then again you know that's that's a real classic example of rubbish Tory messaging you know we want all the schools to go back on the 1st of June but we won't fine you if, if your kids don't go you know what's it, it, they they they're trying to they're trying to you know have their cake and eat it i think in, in some ways but the, at the moment I, my understanding is there will be no fines for children that don't go back there's no sense of compulsion well the danger is that uh, and the reason some of these fines i mean i think the fines are, are controversial uh, and they are not as simple as always being a good thing personally um but the reason they were introduced was to stop um, middle class or more wealthy parents taking children on elongated holidays um, compared to always knocking on the door of poorer parents because their kids um, weren't in school and it, the idea was to say actually the holiday is just as unacceptable as as truanting you know kind of just because the parent says it's okay that's why the fines were introduced I'm not sure they work out like that in practice but you know kind of that's the the, the point was to try and stop a, a social difference there is a danger if you're now going to do that certain children of certain demographics might all go back and others won't you know kind of a, and, and i don't know the consequences of that uh, I, i'll bring you in phil on this but i'm going to ask you another question as well at the same time which is the staff version of this which is what will happen if staff are on the shielding list or they feel that they can't go back to work will they be forced so you know kind of you know both questions there i, I guess but the, the staff one must be very worrying for some of those teachers who might be in risk themselves yeah absolutely um i mean just on the question of, of fines and attendance kate's right you know there, there shouldn't be any fines at this point i was in a, um, a meeting with members in a large primary school a virtual meeting yesterday and um, they had been surveying their parents as to who in the year groups that were being asked to go back. They weren't even looking at 1st of June. They were looking at something later, a more sensible approach. Um, and of the respondents, it was less than 50% of the entire um, year group. You're probably looking at between a quarter and a third of parents saying they would actually send their children back. I think the government has, has utterly failed to convince parents that, that, that reopening this at this point is safe um it, it but it, it raises wider questions you know we've heard a lot out of the government saying we've got to get back for the, the disadvantaged students for you know and i i take no lectures whatsoever from this government on um support for disadvantaged students our union has been highlighting the lack of funding for special educational needs and the the, the cutting of sure start and and um support for uh, for disadvantaged students for a long time while well, the government has been tearing those up 
And only now do they suddenly seem to be so concerned. And I think it's because of the economics of it. I think what we're seeing is the government saying, basically, working class kids can go back. And, um, and, and, and you know, their families will have to deal with the consequences of that because their, their parents are needed to work. Um, so it, it, I think it's got serious um, implications um, in terms of which groups of students we're going to see coming back in. With regards to staff, um, the union's taken a very strong line that um, vulnerable and shielding uh, staff shouldn't go in. And, and, and we're taking a, a far broader definition of vulnerable than the government. And that's been very successful. I mean, certainly during the period of limited opening, our members who are able to go in, you know, they don't, they're not vulnerable themselves, they don't live with someone vulnerable, they are desperate to get in. I mean, you know, at my own school, I've been bumped off the rotor a number of times because other people say, Phil, can I go in? I live on my own in a flat. I, I desperately want to get in. Um, and I've got a lot of union work. So, you know, we work it out. Our members are desperate to go in. Um, so there we've been very successful that, that people who, even though they might not fall exactly into the shielding category have been protected. We're going to continue to do that. Um, and we believe we can continue to do that. You know, we, we've got to protect school staff who've, who've got vulnerabilities, even if it doesn't fall into the very crude categories the government have, have drawn up. More broadly, in terms of unsafe working environments, um, all workers have the right not to have to go into an unsafe workplace. We do not want to be in the position where large numbers of our members are individually deciding I'm not going in, I can't go in, it isn't safe. That, that's, that's a, that will be very chaotic. And the way to avoid that is for head teachers to engage with unions to plan, which, you know, huge numbers of head teachers are. But really importantly for the government to engage with the unions nationally to properly plan, which, which they're not, um, you know, because we will protect our members, but we want to do it in a planned way that gets schools back, not in a way where we're having to, to, to go to a last resort of, of members refusing to attend an unsafe workplace. Yeah, it's always important to say any worker, not just a teacher, any worker in any workplace, if you feel that your safety is compromised, it is your right not to enter that workplace and then seek redress uh, for that issue. Always best to do it via a union because they will give you the best protection, but the health and safety um, laws are for everyone. Um, and you shouldn't feel like you have to compromise those basic levels of safety. And that does mean that for notifiable diseases, which um, coronavirus is, your employer has a duty to put in measures to protect you. And they don't have a duty to put in measures to protect you only if they can find the right equipment. The law doesn't say that. They have the duty to put those things in. And if they can't find the right equipment or if they can't do the right thing, it is against the law for them to require you to go back to work. Um, now, as with all laws, and we could have a big discussion about the destruction of the criminal justice system um, under the Conservatives, the enforcement of it is incredibly weak. And of course, because of the loss of large amounts of things like legal aid, it means it is very difficult. And that's why doing things through a union will give you the protection to be able to pursue those cases when need be. But that's a broader point that everyone should feel uh, comfortable about. Look, I've got a question here from Danny Rowe, um, which I suspect is a slightly, um, uh, a slightly uh, rhetorical question, but I'm going to take it with, uh, with, with, with another question from uh, Rowan Milstead. So Danny says, will the two metre distancing be implemented? And if each person needs two metre circle, um, how many square metres will be required for 15 students and one teacher? Well, I'm sure we can do the maths. Rowan says, uh, which is, I, I feel like maybe there's a link here. I'd like to know what the government's plans are for a constructive discussion with people who are actually in the know the head teachers, the union reps, the teachers, so that it's a clear that a workable plan for phased reopening can be put together. These people have successfully kept schools open in limited capacity thus far, with no guidance whatsoever from the government, so the professionals should be at the very heart 
of the matter in the meantime? It's a long question, so I'll cut to the... Um, uh, to Are we the... allowed to applaud? Are we allowed to go like... <laughs> yes, please do. It, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, well said, that man, well said. <laughs> says track and trace needs to be effectively... Um, uh, in, uh, their educators shouldn't be put in jeopardy. We would love schools to reopen, but it needs to happen in a coordinated, structured and worthwhile fashion. Can the government seek guidance from the people who are best equipped to do this, please? So there's two questions here about what are the practical ways that what the government should be doing? So how should the government be going about this, I guess, what they're not doing at the moment? You know, they should be engaging trade unions, they should, they should also be engaging local authorities, you know, the edu part of the problem with this mess is the destruction of the local education authority. I was on a call earlier on where um, a senior officer of the Brighton Council kind of said, well, we're not an education ed authority anymore, we're the local authority, we don't do education per se, you know, kind of, there's this mindset, and it's quite right, that many of their powers have been stripped away. I still think that you can call them the local education authority personally. I think you're uh, clutching on straws to make that argument uh, um, that, that you shouldn't be. But they have their powers have been reduced. Their ability to coordinate has been reduced. You've had this um, this this um, individualized approach for each school. Um, that does mean that there isn't really anyone in the coordinating seat here. The government have failed. Local authorities aren't able to in the same kind of way. And many head teachers and teachers in schools are not the experts on the virus part, but they are the experts on how it can be implemented. Phil, do you feel, I mean, I, I suspect I know the answer to this. I suspect you don't feel that the union's really been nationally engaged well enough. Uh, locally, have... Uh, have the union been engaged? Are there discussions at that kind of level? Um, it varies from area to area locally. Uh, our, you know, our experience in Brighton and Hove is vastly superior to our experience in East Sussex. Um, it, it is very difficult, even at a local education authority level, um, if the national plans aren't there, and you know the root of the problem is the government. It wasn't just the teachers um, and, and education workforce unions that didn't know the 1st of June date was coming out. The head teachers, um, professional associations didn't know either. Local authorities didn't know. Academy change didn't know. I mean, even the devolved governments didn't know that they were going to make that announcement. I mean, that's the level of discussion and engagement that, that the, the government has gone through. So it's very difficult if you're starting from that point of view. But without a doubt, um, the discussions between unions and the local authority in Brighton have been purposeful, useful, and got us to a safer place than the discussions we've had in East Sussex. Now we have had discussions, but not enough, and all too often discussing why something has taken place rather than what is the right thing to take place. Um, and school by school, of course, it, it has to be done but that should be the, the detail, not the overall plan. Rachel Greener here asks, um, uh, who decides if a school opens? Is it the individual school or the council? So you were just about to touch on that, I think, Phil. You were saying case by case, school by school. Is it just the head? Is it the governors? Is it the council? It's very confusing for parents to work out where that decision is being made. It used to be so much clearer in the old days. It was easier for teachers, head teachers, and everyone as well but it's different for different schools, is it, as well? Yeah, well, we have a very, very atomised school system. I mean, ultimately, um, despite what you will hear, um, there is a huge amount of autonomy to local authority schools. So in a local authority school, ultimately, um, the governing body and the head make that decision. You know, hopefully they will have a lot of dialogue with the local authority and wouldn't go against clear local authority advice. Most, most won't. Um, but then, of course, you've got academies. Now, actually, completely contrary to all the uh, rhetoric, it, it's schools in a multi-academy trust that don't have autonomy. So there they will be directed by the trust. So you could have and will have in, in a lot of cases, trusts based, not just you know, possibly in other parts of the country, certainly in different counties, instructing schools on what to do many, many miles away from where they normally operate. So we have a very, very disjointed system. 
Um, and it, it's very difficult for parents to to sort of engage with that. I mean, if, if your child goes to um, uh, a school in a multi-academy trust and that, that multi-academy trust is based in Kent or London, how do you then have any impact or any feeding in to those decisions? You, you can't really. I mean, th there are some abilities for the local authorities to sometimes influence these decisions and have discussions with people. And my view is that they should still utilize their local authority appointing governors more strongly than many do. I've had many arguments with um, Stuart Gilmore, who's the Sussex chief, I think pretty useless and uh, a man that shouldn't be in post, but, uh, but he is, he's the head of education in East Sussex and uh, um, slowly selling off and destroying our schools in Peacehaven. But that's another issue for another day. But um, I've had an argument with him previously to say, why doesn't East Sussex utilize those LEA appointed uh, governors. I know they're meant to then look at the best interests of the school, but the LEA used to. Years ago, the LEA would ring up the local authority governors and say, this is what we expect you to do. I mean, East Sussex used to be extremely activist in this. And when we had the precursor to the academy system, the school maintained, uh, the, 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 the grant maintained system to stop schools um, going over to the grant maintained system in East Sussex. East Sussex County Council used to threaten to remove local authority appointed governors and replace them with people that would oppose it and fight it tooth and nail if any school thought about going down that route. Now those are long gone I'm afraid and now East Sussex is usually the one banging the drum for privatisation and destruction of our education system led by Stuart Gilmore who should be got rid of. But uh, going to Brighton and Hove, Kate, um, uh, ben here asks, uh, and we were kind of touching on this, will Brighton come up with a different return date than the government? Um, I suspect it's not as simple as that, uh, but, uh, but, but I know we're looking at trying to produce some guidelines that would be across the, across the city for schools on this. Well, I mean, with regards to the previous question, it, yeah. it is down to the head with the agreement of the Board of Governors, but the role of the local authorities, I understand it, is to make sure that the risk assessment that the schools use are fit for purpose and that we offer expertise and advice about setting up those risk assessments to make sure that they're, they're robust. And in, and in that way, we try to maintain a uniformity um, across the city. Um, I, because really there's, it's a bit of a misnomer really, because to me, the government haven't given a return date. They've, they've said the 1st of June for three cohorts, but they haven't made it compulsory. And they know that they can't, not, not, not without legislation. I mean, obviously if the government, you know, passes legislation, we, we you know, we can't break the law, but as it, as it stands, they're kind of reaping their, what they sowed, as, as Phil said right at the beginning. The, it's so fragmented now, the system, that heads have a lot of discretion. And um, so we, the local authority, and interestingly, when we had this meeting yesterday, there were some very, very, very experienced councillors who've been, I won't name who they are, but, you know, not they're not Labour councillors, I'll put it that way. And, um, you know, they were saying, but, but, you know, but at what point can we say they've got to go back? And we said, well, we, we can't. We never can say that. And that was a real shock. I don't think people realise that. So um, I think across Brighton, we would strive to have a, a, if we possibly could, to have a kind of uniform return. But we do have, you know, lots of different types of schools. We've got some very old buildings. We've got some purpose-built buildings. And when you're talking about safety and social distancing, all of those things are, are really quite pertinent. You know, some schools haven't got playing fields and some schools have got more playing fields than you can shake a hockey stick at, you know. So we, what we're trying to do is be supportive of the schools and, and, and come up with a citywide, you know, response. And, 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 and I'm glad Phil said what he said, that, that pleases me. That I, but I feel like officers, you know, elected members, unions, heads, there's it, a very much a united front and, and everybody has the same thing everyone has the same goal to get the children back as quickly and as safely as possible right right look i'm going to touch on some uh, one question or two questions that are linked about early years and then i think we will start wrapping this up i hope it's been useful for people to listen to and to see what the thinking is across uh, the piece from professionals and, and counselors alike uh, i've got a question here 
and then a statement to some extent. So Kate uh, Bradley says, why isn't there more government guidelines for nursery ages as their needs and requirements are different to school children? And nursery seemed to be a kind of add-on that they just said, oh, our nurseries will, will open. I have a question or a statement here from uh, Sheila, uh, which I guess we'll throw this into the pot in this, uh, in, in this answer, which is children in other countries don't start school until they're seven and they're fully ready to learn. Education doesn't suffer as a result. They thrive and reception near one children, therefore should be the last, not the first back. Uh, they're too vulnerable. They don't understand and have longer to catch up. Let them be at home and learn through play and other activities like baking, gardening and the arts. Thank you, BHCC, Brighton Hove City Council, for taking the sensible stance on this and having everyone's top safety as priority. Uh, now the government needs to follow suit. So th there's something about early years here. Should, should actually our focus be trying to get back the very youngest? Um, or actually, is sometimes our approach to forcing very young people into education and into a kind of rigid testing scheme, which starts so early uh, nowadays, is that really very helpful for our children anyway? And is that the bit that we should be prioritising in this kind of crisis? Uh, do you have a kind of view on this, Kate? Um, well, I do. If I, if I unmute, I have unmuted. Um, I, I do think that that nursery years provision has been like the Cinderella service in a lot of this. It, it doesn't get mentioned, and um, you know, I've been round to lots of the nurseries um, in my role as as deputy chair, and you know, I, I was extraordinarily concerned about them because there was no PPE, lots of personal care going on. There's no no possibility of any sort of social distancing with children of that age you know if, if, if children you know if babies are, are having nappies changed you know you, you, you although you might want to do that from a distance unfortunately you can't but so you know I think that they were forgotten for a long time and but they they you know the workers there went in and, and they worked really hard and some of them are quite low paid some of the carers in the in the nursery mm -hmm. sector so you know and I take the there is a part of me that, that agrees about that we send children to school so, formal schooling maybe too early but I mean that's another whole other argument about whether you know the decimation of the sure start service I mean you know that 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 was you know that was so wonderful and to see that dismantled is, is absolutely heartbreaking but I mean the other thing that's true is that those children are probably happier at home and and you know but my other worry is that at the at the upper end of the the age range are those are also the children that are the least likely to socially distance. I mean, they're, you know, when they get sort of a bit rebellious, my fourteen year old grandson needs to be told, you know. And uh, so I, I I just I think I think maybe there is a point. I mean, I think who I I'm the year I'm most concerned about actually at the moment is the year that's year six because they're doing that big leap up to you know to, to secondary school and I think that that is a is a huge you know it's a hugely significant time um uh for children and that that you know not only do they have they lost all that saying goodbye to that kind of you know that nurturing junior school primary school um environment and all their friends and you know moving away and forming but you know they've lost all of that those goodbyes and I think the the hellos are going to be very very strange for them so you know it, it's it's hard to know where to start but I've got I have got a lot of sympathy about you know sending children to school I know they do it in, in the Scandinavian countries they send them a lot later don't they I think you made a good distinction there earlier on Kate where you said it's about it's not necessarily about no education it's about a formal level of rigid education yes. compared to early years education is really important and Brighton and Hope from a historic point of view, who had been quite good in having nursery schools, you know, kind of places where people could go and learn an appropriate way at a very young age, and then sure start. Over the years, of course, unfortunately, we've lost uh, too many uh, of, 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 of them, and they've not been supported nationally. And I know many nurseries, and I've had nurseries contact me, have been running on shoestrings for far too long. East Sussex, mm -hmm. And Bratton and Hove, Bratton and Hove is part of East Sussex for government funding models. Yes. So in we, really and Hove, we really suffer and, financially because of that, you know. Exactly. So even, we get the lowest so amount. We get outstanding Ofsted yeah. inspections of our nursery provision. We get the lowest amount, don't we, in Brighton yeah. and yes, East Sussex yeah. out of any of the authorities in yeah. the rest of the South East. Yeah. But we know I wonder Brighton, why. <laughs> yeah, but we know Bratton and Hove 
cost of living are yeah. definitely not one of the lowest in uh, the indeed. southeast. So there's a real problem that a lot of nurseries have been running on shoestrings. We've kind of got this quasi, of course, patchwork of private, public and um, nurseries, nursery schools, uh, nurseries in schools, those kinds of things. And we also, of course, uh, have then a difficulty that early on there was a big mess up with the furlough scheme. So the government said to nurseries, you can furlough all your staff. And then they said, oh, no, you're already receiving the nursery grants. Yes, that's right. Yeah. The, so you can't claim furlough because you can't claim furlough for money that was previously paid by the government. And so they withdrew the furlough from all those people, but said that they would continue the nursery grants, but the nurseries weren't eligible to get the top up amount that they often get from teacher uh, from parents for the other aspects of the service that they offer. So nurseries have been have had three different forms of advice on this mm -hmm. in terms of their funding and it has been particularly difficult for them to work out and, and you will see uh, that suffering. Phil, in terms of the National Education Union, do you have a particular view or um, on, on, on about generally yeah, I, I think, I think advice for nurseries but also about that early years issue? Well, I think I think Kate's right. What what we were expecting when the first of June announcement was made was actually an announcement that was far based around when it's safe, and in primaries, year six being the likely first year to go back. They're a bit older; they can understand things like social distancing better. Although I think it's it's still pretty much unenforceable. Mm. Um, and of course, they have got that transition, which is which is a difficult time for a lot of children normally so that was what we were expecting i think the fact that the government um threw in reception year one nursery it, it exposes that this is about getting parents back to work it isn't about yeah uh, what's right for the children at all so yeah absolutely i think there are there are major concerns about how you operate some sort of social distancing with children so young firstly you probably can't but also really you probably shouldn't you know the 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 the, the inhumanness of, of not being able to you know allow them to you know you know kids of that age are like magnets they just glue themselves together i mean you know that's that's what they do and to try and stop that is 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 probably impossible and probably shouldn't be attempted anyway more broadly the the yeah absolutely i mean the union is absolutely in favor of a more play-based curriculum for the younger students you know it, it it works um you know we we formally school children far too early here i mean now we've got the ludicrous implementation of a baseline test as if you can mm. kind of plot a flight path of children's education on a nice straight line they'll have to do it will be a teacher t assessment test at what age very young isn't it it's like yeah 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 it's um you know five-year-olds will be coming in and doing this. Um, I think a lot of parents and people don't realise this is one of the changes that the government are, are imposing. So as soon as a child joins a school, the teacher effectively will have to do a test on them to yeah. see where they are and they'll be boxed in that category in terms of the direction that they're, they're meant to go. Yeah, and it will be used to determine where they should be as if children, you know, yeah. develop in a nice straight line. But, but beyond that, I think the whole crisis has shown what's important in schools and what's not you know immediately that this hit sats out the window they didn't happen this year yeah there's not a single child or parent in the country that's concerned that their child hasn't set their sats because they're entirely there to um monitor the schools and, and beat the schools with you know they don't do anything for the kids we've done teacher assessments for our gcse's i know mine are robust you know um Ofsted, gone uh, immediately. All these sorts of things that really are of no benefit to the children, but are all about a marketization and a, a commodification of education. That's the stuff we, you know, when push came to shove, we didn't need it. And mm -hmm. I think our union would really like to work with parents and, and you know, the Labour Party and, and other organisations to try and prevent a lot of that coming back because mm -hmm. it, damages our, our, our education system to have it so monitored yeah. so commodified mm -hmm. yeah. and we can do but a lot better. also phil I mean, uh, and, and lloyd in schools as in the whole of society it's really really highlighted very starkly how 
fragile people's lives are, how vulnerable they are, how little of a safety net they have. You know, when you look at the impact that, you know, of children losing free school dinner or a free breakfast club, you know, the, the, the fact that, that, that families are so reliant on those services. And then all of a sudden, everybody wakes up to the fact that some children haven't got access to Wi-Fi or they can't do their homework online. You think, well, actually, that's always been the case, but at least now, it's out there, isn't it? And we can, no one can ignore it anymore. But I think it really has ex exposed, you know, Brighton is a city of, of, of very stark divides, actually, you know, and probably, well, not probably all big cities will be. And we've been forced to see really starkly what the dif what, what difference there are between us. And, you know, someone said, that, you know, the people with gardens and the people without, that's the yeah. big new dividing line. <laughs> exactly. People with gardens, people with access to outside spaces. Oh, no, I know it. <laughs> yes, and, and that's why actually the government advice for people to be able to go to parks and the beach is perfectly acceptable. If you've not got a garden and everything yourself, and if you're going local. Um, look, um, I think that this has been a really interesting discussion. I, it was interesting you, uh, Phil, at the end there, finished on the idea of sats not actually necessarily being necessary. Look, I'm not that old. So uh, SATs were introduced when I was, the, SAT, the statutory assessment was introduced when I was at primary school. And the National Union of Teachers, as it was at the time, uh, went on strike on the year that I was meant to do my Key Stage 1 SATs assessment. And they also went on strike on the year that I was meant to do my Key Stage 2 assessment. They were rolled out, the, the same cohort was meant to do both years. So it was rolled out first in Key Stage 1 then he says two um, uh, for our year. Uh, we were meant to be the first year. Thankfully, I never did it. I don't think it harmed me. Some people might have different views, but I think one of those things was, thank goodness the union saved me from all that pressure and stress that my <laughs> brothers and sisters had to have. Often the union does save us from pressure and stress. And the last comment here that I've got from Terry before I go back to you to just quickly say bye, is Terry, uh, Terry Seymour says, we need to get more people to join a union to make sure they're protected. Quite right, Terry. I, uh, Terence, as I should say, sorry, I think we all agree on that one. Uh, Kate, uh, Phil, any last words before we say goodbye? No, no, not at all. No. Just thanks, for, thanks for having yeah. us. Been very yeah, thanks for inviting, inviting no, me. Fantastic. Great. Thank you very much. It's always, always a pleasure. Um, and uh, hopefully next week we'll do another one. Uh, we've got a few in the pipeline, one on fire cups in East Sussex. Um, where we have 10 uh, pumps that are being threatened to be cut, as well as um, two of the full-time high-rise ladders to be turned to part-time. The Lewis station will lose half of its um, staff, so will the New Haven station, and Brighton Hove will lose two to five staff members across, uh, firefighters across uh, the piece. This is at a time that the government given the fire authority more money. Um, it's not a huge amount of money that they need, they could make almost these savings by merging East Sussex and West Sussex Fire Service, which we proposed a number of years ago, and you would save on the management costs. But instead, they are putting the cuts down on the front line. Isn't it a similar story? So we'll probably try and get some firefighters and our friends at the FBU to come and talk about that. But we also have a, uh, one of these planned for uh, looking at the recovery and particularly about the creative industries uh, here in Brighton, which particularly are going to be affected the, the hospitality and creative industries, uh, which we know desperately need our support. Look, thank you very much again, Phil and Kate, and have a good night. Keep safe, everyone. <laughs>